Dingai Fusion Records. Chapter 13. Looking for. In Gonko's file room. Ah. Chen Xin cheered, I've finally found it. Chen Xin laid out a map of a building in the ancient city of Chang'an 300 years ago, then asked Tuaba Yan, where is this? Tuaba Yan was in charge of the defense both inside and outside the city, so he could identify it straight away. He said, west of the city, Songbei residence. I'll take you there tomorrow. Chen Xin wanted to go over to take a look now before the sun set, but he remembered that Tuaba Yan had already accompanied him for an entire afternoon, and those on duty in the palace may not be allowed to leave without authorization. He was about to thank Tuaba Yan and head over there by himself when Tuaba Yan insisted on sending him back to the palace, otherwise it would be difficult for him to account for matters. Chen Xin couldn't make him change his mind, so he could only bid farewell to Tuaba Yan outside the imperial garden. Chen Xin did not want to return to the sleeping chambers and see Xiang Xu's face at all, but since there was some progress with his investigation, he thought that he should let Xiang Xu know about it, so he decided to go back and have dinner there as well. At that moment, Xiang Xu was listening to Princess King He introduce her cousin to him with a numb look on his face. King He and Murong Chang's paternal aunt had married into the Tuaba tribe, and although she was the official wife, she had no children. Her husband had a son with a concubine afterwards, who was Tuaba Yan. Tuaba Yan was never doted on when he was little, and no one in his family really paid particular attention to him. Only his grandmother loved him dearly. After his grandmother passed away, Tuaba Yan grew to be 14 years old and joined the Imperial Army. He was a good sapling for practicing martial arts and could wield the halberd well, so he stood out in the martial selection. His appearance was as beautiful as a jade as well, so he obtained the favor of Fujian, who recruited him to be by his side. Two years later, Murong Chong left the capital to take office. Fujian was truly lonely, so he more or less shifted some of his affection onto Tuaba Yan. But Tuaba Yan wasn't Murong Chong, and their temperaments were far too different as well. Fujian thought about it over and over, but never asked for him. In the end, and instead doted on him very much. He regarded Tuaba Yan as a younger brother and nurtured him as such, intending to look for a prospective marriage partner for him. It's just that, after looking everywhere, no one seemed appropriate. Princess King he had specifically asked him about it before, but Tuaba Yan himself couldn't specify what kind of partner he wanted. He did have a certain goal though he liked Han people the most. And then last night, Tuaba Yan first met Chen Xin in Yuan Xian's residence and heard Yuan Xian mention the past although the Chen family was already ruined, Chen Zhe still had a rather high prestige among scholars and officials. About half of the Qin court's three departments were students taught by Chen Xin's father. Since the families were well matched in terms of social status, and Tuaba Yan had fallen in love at first sight, Princess King He quickly rushed over to inquire about him. Xiang Xu didn't expect Chen Xin to have such a family background, and his usual expression of an ancient well with no waves actually now had some ripples and oscillations, it was as if he had just gotten to know Chen Xin once more. Meanwhile, Yuan Xian, who was still outside the palace, kept nodding his head and echoing whatever Princess King he said with continuous yes, 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 and even went into the palace, pacing left and right over and over, which made Xiang Xu extremely agitated. He just wanted to find a flying knife and nail him onto a pillar like he was nailing a fly. Suddenly, silence fell within the palace at the same time Chen Xin had come in. AI. Chen Xin took a look with a baffled expression, and Yuan Xian was immediately all smiles as he greeted him, Tianke. Hello Xian Ge. Chen Xin avoided Yuan Xian's hug and nodded at Princess King He. Princess King He smiled, went out with Tuaba Yan. Chen Xin was filled with doubts, how did you know? Princess King He said, come, Jijo will pour a cup of tea for you. As she spoke, she went to pick up a pot and said, I have something good to talk to you about later. Yet Chen Xin said, no need, there are already ready-made ones, 
I'm dying of thirst. Then he picked up a cup of tea on the table and drank it. Cup after cup, he polished off all the cups of tea that the Chang'an nobles had poured for their marriage proposals. Everyone. Yi. Chen Xin continued, and what's this? He picked up a portrait from the table and studied it, yet Xiang Shu pressed it down with one hand as he said angrily, Stop touching things. What's wrong with taking a look? Chen Xin grabbed the folded paper. Xiang Shu tugged at it, and because of his strong inner force, the portrait was torn into two on the spot, so Chen Xin had to casually throw the paper back, which smacked onto Xiang Shu's body. Xiang Shu, you. Chen Xin finished drinking the tea and said, There's a lead, I still have to get busy. Give me some money. He was thinking that he wanted to go to the Songbei residence to take a look since it wasn't dark yet. Princess King he got up and said, I'll ask Yanner to accompany you. It just so happens that I wanted to ask him to be off night duty tonight. Chen Xin quickly said, No need, no need. When they said their goodbyes in the Imperial Garden, he had heard that Tuaba Yan needed to guard a banquet for Fujian tonight, so he stretched a hand out towards Xiang Shu. I don't have any. Xiang Shu said coldly. Chen Xin thought, do you think I can't walk? He didn't beg him and just left in anger. Chen Xin didn't leave for long before Princess King he wondered, Great Chen Yu, where did we leave off just now? At this moment, a palace attendant came, evidently someone who had been dispatched by the wave of people in the afternoon to inquire about some news. He peeped into the palace to sneak a look, and once he saw that all the milk tea from every family silver, gold, and enamel cups were all drunk while the hall was littered with waste paper torn in half, he was instantly overjoyed and broke into a run. It took a long time before Princess King He and Xiang Shu snapped out of their stupor. They shouted together, Come back. Xiang Shu quickly got up to give chase, but that palace attendant had long since ran out of sight. So that night, all families knew that the great Chanyu drank all the milk tea they had poured after they left, while all the portraits were torn in half. And what did that mean? Shouldn't everyone quickly make preparations to send all their youngest sons to the great Chanyu? Chen Xin left the palace and studied the map. It was almost dusk. When he passed by the doors of several houses, he heard several families setting off firecrackers. He didn't know what was happening and thought that they were in the midst of celebrating a festival. Viang Palace was close to the west side of the city. But even so, he still took close to two hours before arriving outside the Songbei residence. It was dark now, and one could hear the beats of the evening drum ring out one after another. The west side of the city was a highland with pine and cypress. Trees planted everywhere. A row of massive buildings were half concealed within the pine forest, and the unbridled laughter of men traveled out from the inside. Chen Xin remembered now, when they parted ways with Feng Qianzhen, he had told them that he would be staying here. Chen Xin circled around outside past about half the residence and still couldn't find the entrance. All he saw was a gate that was shut tight, and two large golden letters glimmered on the gate, Xifeng Bank. Chen Xin. Is anyone there? Chen Xin shouted. He compared the place with the map in his hands and was certain that this was the place. After circling for another round, he arrived outside a dense forest. He saw two stones there, and two more stones at the side, the words evergreen pines and cypresses were written on the left, while Senluo Wangziang were written on the right. Chen Xin walked into the forest along the road and made several turns along the winding path. He suddenly felt like something was amiss, the trees and rockery inside were arranged according to the eight gates Kai, Xiu, Shen, Shang, Du, Jing, Si, Jin set up by Kongming of the Three Kingdoms. After Chen Xin was formally recognized as his master's student, his first lesson was on how to break through this eight gates array, so it wouldn't be a problem for him at all. He just hesitated in that since this array was set up, the place inside shouldn't be someplace open to public. Would it be too rude to just charge right in? However, just as he was about to turn around, 
he could no longer go back through the path he had taken through the outer eight gates. The only way to pass through was to walk all the way to the end, then leave from the northeast's mountain Shen Gate, so Chen Xing could only force himself to walk in. After walking round and round, he suddenly realized that this eight trigrams array would change in various ways. After turning around a rockery, a huge residence suddenly appeared in front of him. Bright lights were lit up inside, and twenty over pairs of martial boots were placed under the corridor. Chen Xin shouted from the outside, Is anyone there? He didn't hear an answer, so Chen Xin took off his boots and stepped up. He pulled the sliding door and he heard a ruckus. Overthrow Fujian. Restore the grate. The room was full of people sitting on the floor, and the crowd's emotions were running high. The residence had excellent soundproofing, so one wouldn't be able to hear the noises that were made inside from the outside at all. From the looks of it, they were obviously in the middle of a conspiracy meeting. Chen Xing, excuse me, does anyone need some tea? If not, I'll head off first. Chen Xing closed the door decisively, and a group of people immediately rushed out from the inside. All of them brandished their knives and swords, drawing their weapons out as they placed them against Chen Xing's neck. Chen Xing had no strength to resist and could only raise both his hands up and say, I really didn't hear anything. Tianke. Feng Qianzhen's surprised voice rang out, How did you get in? Stop. He's one of us. Chen Xing entered the room with knives against his neck. A wide couch stood deep in the center, on which sat a man in his twenties dressed in a loose robe with large sleeves. Feng Qianzhen sat beside the man and drank as he faced a short table. Stop. That man said, invite that little brother in. He then glanced at Feng Qianzhen. Feng Qianzhen nodded slightly to signal, it's okay, then waved his hand to motion for Chen Xing to come over. The group of martial artists detaining Chen Xing released him and let him go to Feng Qianzhen. There's not much time, the man said, there is a guest present, but it's okay for him to hear it. Let's continue talking, Xi'an Jiang's catastrophe this time was not caused by a momentary mistake. Chen Xing glanced at Feng Qianzhen and saw that he now seemed completely different from the Feng Qianzhen whom he had traveled with. He had changed into a loose robe embroidered with patterns of leaves and blossoming flowers, and his Huanxiao knife was placed on the central table in front of the man. Even a Xianbei as beautiful as a woman would appear bewitching adorned in that kind of flowery martial robe, but on Feng Qianzhen, it didn't seem out of place at all, and was strangely fitting. It naturally gave him an air that was magnificent to the extreme. Chen Xing looked at the man in the center, then at Feng Qianzhen. Feng Qianzhen whispered into Chen Xing's ear, he's my older brother, Feng Qianyi. A kid like you actually managed to break through the eight trigrams array he set up outside. I really underestimated you. Chen Xing, I, I was just walking around at random, what are you all doing? Feng Qianzhen, plotting a rebellion ah. It's so obvious, can't you tell? Chen Xing said sincerely, I could. Which stage have you guys progressed to? Feng Qianzhen, there has never been any progress, it's so distressing na. I don't even want to continue playing with them anymore. Fujian's perverse way of doing things have angered both the heavens and the people. There are a lot who are resentful among the Di, Xianbei, and Xiangnu tribes, both of you, don't whisper amongst yourselves below. Feng Qianyi knocked a few times on the table with the ruler in his hand, the great Chanyu beyond the Great Wall has entered Chang'an and released a clear signal. Perhaps, before long, all the tribes within the city will unite to overthrow Fujian. When Chen Xing heard this, the corners of his mouth twitched, and he whispered to Feng Qianzhen, No matter how I look at it, the relationship between the two of them seems quite okay. Feng Dage, are you sure the source of this news is trustworthy? Feng Qianzhen promptly motioned for him to raise his questions later. Feng Qianyi said to the crowd again, Next, I'll let my younger brother tell everyone about what he saw and heard on the road to the capital from Xiangyang. 
Feng Qinzhen cleared his throat and began describing the hostility of the Hu people in the central plains towards Fujian. While Feng Qinzhen spoke, Feng Qinyi added that Fujian had been in power for many years, and according to the plan made by Wang Meng, a famous official, he formulated the so-called respect Hans and reject the Hu's national policy. However, not only did he fail to please the Han people, but he had also offended the Hus who were backing him. Now, the five barbarians were all openly voicing their discontent and had begun to oppose Fujian. The great Qin may seem to have a strong military force like a sun at noon, but the truth was that after Wang Meng's death, internal forces became very complicated and have been tottering on the verge of collapse a long time ago. Everyone was in a great mood after listening to him, as if everyone in Chang'an, no matter if they were a Hu or Han would rush straight into the imperial palace as soon as Feng Qinyu issued a call for action and hack Fujian, the incapable ruler, into pieces. After Feng Qinzhen elaborated upon the entire process, he didn't offer any comments. Feng Qinyi, who presided over the meeting, waited for the hall to become quiet again before saying, this is what the situation is like. After this, when everyone is moving around in the central plains, the south has already allocated a lot of funds to support our great undertaking of expelling the barbarians and rejuvenating the Han dynasty. Next year will be a critical period, so we must not neglect. Perhaps it was because there was a guest today, or perhaps the theme of today's conference was different, but Feng Qinyi didn't really go into affairs related to the rebellion in detail. After he simply summarized the situation for this month and prospects for the year, the meeting was adjourned. All the Jianghu martial experts stood up and took their leave one by one. They were very respectful and polite towards Feng Qinyi during their discourses but treated Feng Qinzhen like they would anyone else and even seemed to look down on him a little. After everyone left, Feng Qinzhen picked up his brother and placed him in a wooden wheelchair at the side. Only then did Chen Xing realize that Feng Qinyi's legs were immobile, and that he needed to be cared for. Come, let's go get dinner. You must be hungry. Feng Qinzhen took the Huan Shao knife and handed it to his elder brother. Feng Qinyi laid the knife on his knees and held it tightly. Feng Qinzhen said to Chen Xing, there are still many things that I have to carefully clarify with you. The three of them left and moved along the hall corridor. Without waiting for Chen Xin to raise his questions, Feng Qinzhen took the initiative to explain. Only then did Chen Xin know that he had actually intruded into the Songbei residence's secret hall by accident. You, you all are, Chen Xin cast a doubtful glance at Feng Qinzhen. He remembered Xiang Shu's evaluation of Feng Qinzhen, and sure enough, this Jianghu vagabond wasn't simple. Un Feng Qinzhen smiled, Xiang's real identity is that of the young manager of the Xifeng Bank. My older brother is the current head of the family. Songbei residence and Xifeng headquarters are in the same place, and they're both part of my family's estate. Feng Qinyi kept silent and was in a daze the whole way down the dark corridor. Chen Xing surveyed his surroundings, after passing through the corridor, they entered the courtyard again. This mysterious place had a lot of twists and turns, after turning around the back of the courtyard, they arrived at a group of inns that covered nearly ten mu. Strangely shaped pine trees stood outside the group of inns, as if they were spirits that guarded this place in the dark. Chen Xing's surprise had already been whetted by the environment of Xifeng Bank. In any case, it didn't matter to him who the Feng family brothers were. What mattered was that the 300-year-old ruins of Chang'an's exorcist headquarters was located here, and from the looks of it, it had most likely been remodeled by the Feng family. Feng Qinyi, who was sitting on the wheelchair, saw Cheng Xian's expression and said calmly, the Songbei residence will only receive Hans. The entrance is on the other side. Very few people will walk through this path at the back. Feng Qinzhen glanced at the drawing in Chen Xing's hand and seemed to realize something. After they passed through the main hall of Songbei residence, they arrived in an eerie building. Feng Qinyi said politely to Chen Xing, since little brother stays with the great Chan Yu, Shulukong, now, I thought the two of you would come here together. On, he, 
I'm actually not that familiar with him. Chen Xing thought to himself that he was just here to look for the old address of the exorcist headquarters, yet he ended up bumping into this group of people discussing their rebellion by accident. How should he get out of this mess? Don't tell me you want to drag me onto your pirate ship BA. He connected it to how Feng Qinyi didn't let him get away, and it was obvious that he planned to make it more difficult for Chen Xin to extricate himself the more he knew about their plans, and instantly felt that this was a little perilous. Chen Xin was usually quite a sanguine person. It was rare for him to be muddle-headed, and he wasn't the least bit foolish, so he continued, I'm staying with Xiang Shu for now just because of a matter. Once it's investigated thoroughly in a few days, I'll have to leave. It's not like anyone amongst that bunch of hus would believe what I say anyway, and I have a lot of things to do. The meaning behind his words was, I have no time to care about your group's affairs either, and it's even less likely for me to inform against you, so there's no need for you to silence me with death. There's no harm, Feng Qinyi said, I had intended for Qin Jun to introduce me anyway. There's no time like the present. For you to come today means that we're fated. Chen Xin glanced at Feng Qin Jun. Feng Qin Yi continued, I'll go make some arrangements. Qin Jun, accompany the great exorcist for dinner first. Chen Xin. As soon as Feng Qin Jun closed the door, Chen Xin glanced at Feng Qin Jun to signal that he wanted an explanation. Feng Qin Jun shrugged helplessly to indicate that he had nothing to say. He leaned down slightly to look at Chen Xing, while Chen Xing said in surprise, How does your older brother know everything? How much did you tell him exactly? Feng Qinjun said, Do you not know what this place is? What news in the world could be hidden from the head of the Songbei residence? Chen Xing, what on earth do you guys do? It doesn't seem like your family runs an inn. Feng Qinjun, to tell you the truth, don't be angry my dear brother, the main business of my family is to open a bank and lend money at usury. Chen Xin looked at how imposing the style of this building complex was and answered, as expected, your family's pretty rich ma. Chen Xin looked around and saw Cao Pai's authentic works hanging on the wall, as well as an ink screen that stood in the room. A servant sent food boxes over, and Feng Qinjun sat down at one side. He held up a pot of boiling water that was on the stove to make tea and explained, as for our side business. Ma, the Xifeng Bank has another role that is, to obtain intelligence all over the world from the south to the north, both within and beyond the Great Wall, our intelligence ranges from major ones like the Emperor's family affairs to small kinds like the common people's 18 generations of ancestors. As long as we're paid, we'll be able to find out anything. There's no intelligence under the sun that the Feng family can't obtain. He was actually the boss of an intelligence group in Chang'an City. Chen Xin just felt like he had really underestimated Feng Qinjun far too much on their journey here. Feng Qinjun finished making tea and made a pleased gesture to Chen Xin. He smiled, so on the first day of our arrival in the capital, Xifeng already knew that Xiang Shu's real identity was Shula Kong, the youngest great Chanyu in the history of the ancient Qi Le Covenant. And also knew that we barged into the Imperial Palace at night. Chen Xing said. Wu, Feng Qinjun said, and we also know that you're the only son of Chen Zhe, a great scholar in Jinyang. During his youth, Yuan Xian studied under your family before, it's just worldly affairs, thieves don't have the heavens in their eyes, Honest and upright gentlemen are never rewarded for their virtue, while scoundrels who have done all sorts of crimes that even their death would not be able to atone for are always. Chen Xin sat down at one side and smiled, it's not right to say that. We conduct ourselves in an upright manner because we think it's right, not because we want to be rewarded. Feng Qinjun was stunned at first, then smiled with relief, yes, yes. You're much more broad-minded than Dage. Then, with a probing look, he asked Chen Xin, that you an Xian. On. Chen Xin was thinking about how to ask about looking for the ruins of the exorcist headquarters. It didn't seem appropriate for him to rummage through boxes and knock cabinets down in other people's homes. 
Yet Feng Qianjun observed Chen Xing's expression and suddenly said, Never mind, it's nothing. Yunwei Xi and flatters the strong and bullies the weak in Chang'an city, he's not someone to be closely acquainted with. I just wanted to remind you. I can tell. Chen Xing said calmly. Feng Qianjun gazed at Chen Xing quietly and looked as if he couldn't bear something. Chen Xing didn't notice his fleeting pity, after eating and drinking tea, he finally dove straight to the point and said to Feng Qianjun, Feng Dage, to be honest, I suddenly came over today because I have a favor to ask of you. Do you still remember the exorcist headquarters we talked about on the way here? After he spoke, the paper door suddenly opened and Feng Qianyi said, My younger brother has already told me everything in its entirety. He steered his wheelchair into the hall. Chen Xing said apprehensively, This truly is a presumptuous request on my part. No after Feng Qianyi entered the hall, Feng Qianjun immediately fell silent. Feng Qianyi said to Chen Xing, Tianke, to tell you the truth, our Feng family was a family of exorcists 300 years ago. We're from the same profession. Chen Xing. Chen Xing stood up at once and stared at Feng Qianjun in shock. Feng Qianyi said lightly, that's the fate I was talking about. Feng Qianyi drew out the Huanxiao knife on his knees. He clamped down on the blade with two fingers and handed it to Chen Xing, this knife was left behind from the Han dynasty, it's a precious knife handed down from generation to generation since ancient times. Sen Luo Wan Xiang is sealed with the vital energy of verdant wood, and when it appears in the world. Chen Xing accepted the knife, it can turn tens of thousands of plants within the divine land into soldiers, move verdant mountains, and level gorges. You know. Feng Qianyi's eyes lit up at once with surprise evident in his gaze. Chen Xing had read about many magic weapons in ancient texts. When he first met Feng Qianjun, he had never paid close attention to his knife. Now, when he accepted it and held it in his hands, he only saw a row of Zonggu characters inscribed on the back of the knife, Sen Luo Wan Xiang. End chapter. Dingai Fusion Records Chapter 14 Entering the Library Chen Xing merely looked at it for a moment before returning the Huanxiao knife into its sheath and even handed it back to Feng Qianyi. He said with a smile, that's great. So you guys are exorcists too. After he said this, he continued ruefully, legends about it have been recorded in ancient texts. Unfortunately, silence has fallen on all magic now, so all magic weapons have turned into scrap iron. As he spoke, Chen Xing started reminiscing in a trance. Which branch of exorcists did the Feng family belong to? However, most of the documents he read at his Shifu's place only included pictures of the monsters, sacred tools, and magic weapons in the human world, they seldom mentioned exorcism genealogy. After all, with a long history, all families would go through ups and downs and could even change their surnames and nationalities due to the unrest in the central plains. There wouldn't be much meaning in investigating one's origins. All magic weapons. Feng Qianyi's gaze clearly looked doubtful as he asked. After hearing Feng Qianyi introduce his family, Chen Xing was really delighted. Like what his Shifu had said before he went down the mountain, there must still be exorcist families in the world. It's just that due to the restraints of the silence on all magic, all magic arts and magic weapons currently lay dormant. Over time, as long as the spiritual chi of heaven and earth gets restored, these exorcist families would become the core forces in resisting Mara. Chen Xing had no doubt at all he could die without regret after completing his arduous task, and there would naturally be exorcists who still exist in this world who would take care of the rest. Except for the heart lamp. Chen Xing decided that he might as well lay everything on the table since everyone was on the same side, and there was no need to hide it from Feng Qianyi. He thought that Feng Qianjun must have told his older brother about it too, so he took the initiative in emitting the light in his hands and explained, the heart lamp resides in a human's body. It exists within my three huns and seven pos, so I can sort of emit some light. After saying this, Chen Xing couldn't help looking at Feng Qianjun again and thought, 
you really hid this from me for a really long time. Feng Qianjun said earnestly, I'm sorry, Brother Tianqi. Yuxiang is under a strict prohibition, so I definitely cannot rashly mention anything about my family's exorcism inheritance to anyone. In fact, over the years, the Feng family's industry and clan members all have a responsibility which is to guard this sacred tool and wait for the day it regains its glory. Before my father died, he handed it to me. I had my difficulties too. Chen Xin nodded and said magnanimously, It's all right, it's always better to be careful. Feng Qinyi said lightly, Little brother, you must know what the world is like today. Over the years, the Feng family has always been fighting to recover the central plains we lost, and Qin Jun embarked on a long and arduous journey to answer the call here from Gesu while banking on the slim chance, that if Sen Luo Wan Xiang really is a so-called ancient magic weapon, then it would be of great help to our great cause of recovering the central plains. Little brother, I remember that you're a Han. When Feng Qinjun heard this, he finally interjected, Dage, Tianqi is thinking of a way to solve all these problems. Chen Xing studied Feng Qinyi, then looked at Feng Qinjun. He smiled. This is just the beginning. Feng Qinjun immediately said, As long as we can help, feel free to let us know. Then I won't hold back. Chen Xing answered. Feng Qinjun motioned for Chen Xing to not be in a hurry to feel delighted, and to let him speak first. He explained Chen Xing's purpose for coming to his older brother. Chen Xing quickly spread out the architectural drawings he had retrieved from Gonko and explained, according to my investigation, at the end of the Han Dynasty, the headquarters of the Chang'an Exorcism Department was in this empty song. I'm just not sure if Xifeng Bank and Songbei residents had dug out anything when it chose to be situated here. For example, ancient maps, letters, and such. After he spoke, Chen Xing looked up to observe Feng Qinyi's expression, then looked at Feng Qinjun. Feng Qinjun shrugged to indicate that he didn't know anything, but Feng Qinyi looked as he usually did and answered, Xifeng Bank was founded by our great-grandfather. When Chang'an was built, this place was a barren hill. Are you certain that the headquarters of the exorcism department was on this mountain? Chen Xing said, if the drawings aren't lying. After Chang'an city was trampled upon and set on fire by Dongzhou, Li Aryu, and others at the end of the Han dynasty, it was so desolate that there was practically nothing left during the Three Kingdom period. It expanded several times during the Jin dynasty, and after the city expanded, it once again suffered through a flood of plundering from the five barbarians when they headed south. Zionists, Hans, Dis all took turns stationing their troops here. Burning came first, followed by pushing, filling, then construction. The difficulty of finding even a brick or wood from 300 years ago had been set in stone long ago, but Chen Xing still held some hope, because the room that the exorcism department kept their scrolls in was underground. It's right here. Chen Xing pointed to a part of the original building. It was the working drawing of the underground construction. He explained, our ancestors must have left some information regarding the silence of all magic that had happened then. This will be a very important clue. Feng Qinjun studied the drawings carefully. He looked at his older brother, and the two brothers exchanged a look. Chen Xing. Chen Xing asked tentatively, can I follow the direction as pointed out in the drawings to take a look? Feng Qinyi pondered for a long time. Feng Qinjun said, I'll take Tianke there. B.A. You can't get in. Feng Qinyi answered, never mind, since he's one of us, it won't do any harm for him to enter once. Chen Xing asked doubtfully, is this place very important? Feng Qinjun wanted to say something, but he was stopped by his older brother. Feng Qinyi finally said, Zifeng's warehouse, it connects underground, and it's all filled with places where money's stored. At night, during the high period, Feng Qinyi leaned against his wheelchair as he took Chen Xing to a huge residence. Feng Qinjun only went to the door before he stopped, and he signaled for Chen Xing to follow his brother in while he would stand guard outside. 
Chen Xin took the lamp that Feng Qianjun handed him. He looked back, and Feng Qianyi seemed to guess what Chen Xin was thinking and said lightly, Qianjun's responsibility is to guard the Xifeng chain. Only the head of the family and the main shopkeeper has ever been allowed in the warehouse. Chen Xin immediately expressed his gratitude and followed Feng Qianyi to enter through a bronze door of the residence. The first door was opened with a key. They reached a slope, while the corridors on both sides were full of shelves made of pig iron. Wooden plagues filled the shelves, and copper coins were piled at the top. After they turned into the second floor, Feng Qianyi still used a key to open the second door. A warehouse that stored silver was behind that door. Chen Xin held up the lamp to illuminate it, and almost the entire room dazzled in the light. This was Chen Xin's first time seeing this much money in his life. It could constitute mountains and seas, just walking through the silver took him a quarter of an hour. The topography isn't right. Chen Xin looked down to match it to the drawings. Feng Qianyi answered, During the Jin dynasty, our ancestors bought this piece of land from Sima Yu, the king of the East China Sea. In order to build this place, they recast 300,000 jin of molten iron into the four walls of this warehouse. Chen Xin looked around in the silver warehouse and asked, Is there anything left behind in the ruins that were cleared up then? Feng Qianyi said, I'm not sure, no records were left behind. I'll take you down to the next floor for a look. Chen Xin didn't doubt him and let Feng Qianyi guide the way in front of him while he looked at the map as he walked. When they arrived at yet another door, Feng Qianyi still opened it with yet another key. It'll be the gold warehouse next. Feng Qianyi continued, Little brother, please don't mention this to anyone after leaving this place. Chen Xin knew that Feng Qianyi was letting him, an outsider, into the most confidential area of the Xifeng Bank because they were both exorcists, and was giving him a lot of face, so he quickly thanked him again. But before the door to the gold warehouse opened, Chen Xin suddenly realized something. The lamp in his hand flickered slightly, as if an invisible wind had passed through his body. What is this? Chen Xin immediately came to attention. Please, come in. The light illuminated the warehouse. All the gold inside were locked in boxes, and there was a total of three floors. When Chen Xin arrived at the last floor, a little hope was suddenly ignited again. Is there anything else underneath? According to the drawings, this should be the headquarters of the exorcism department that was stuck at the foot of the mountain. Their exorcist predecessors must have chosen this place to be their headquarters for a reason. Chen Xin once saw in a book, before the spiritual chi of heaven and earth disappeared, heaven and earth each had its own ley line. The direction of the heaven's spiritual flow was called heaven's ley line, while the one that corresponded to it on earth was called earth's ley line. There were many nodes in the earth's ley line, and occasionally, spiritual chi would leak out at weaker places, which is the blessed land that Feng Shui pursues. Chen Xin placed the lamp on a short table, which cast their shadows onto a wall. Feng Qianyi kept silent for a moment, then said, If we continue walking down, there is indeed another floor. As he spoke, he pushed his wheelchair and went around a shelf to arrive in front of a wall. A small, pitch black door was embedded in the wall, and there was a will on it. Chen Xing asked anxiously, Would it be okay for me to go in? Please turn around first. Feng Qianyi said politely. He extended a hand out to cover the iron wheel and tried turning it. This should be a certain type of mechanism. Chen Xin turned around with his back facing Feng Qianyi, and heard the grating sound of the iron wheel traveling over from behind him. I'm really very grateful for this. Chen Xin said. Feng Qianyi answered, Little brother, you're too polite. I heard you're staying in Viang Palace now. It's not easy for outsiders to read that drawing of yours, you must have been given special concession by Fujian. Chen Xing, sort of, Fujian Ma, aside from the first time I met him, I've never seen him again. I only arrived at Chang'an last night too. Sure enough, while Feng Qianyi calibrated the wheel, he casually said, 
your family was embroiled in the chaos of war, so I think you must have come to Chang'an this time to get revenge. When Chen Xin heard this, he was stunned at once and answered, I never actually thought about that. How can I take revenge with my level of strength? Besides, I have more important things to do. Feng Qinyi continued amidst the soft sounds of calibration, little brother, although it's not right of me to say this since we've just met for the first time today, I'd still like to raise a presumptuous question. Chen Xin didn't answer, and just listened doubtfully. Since you live in the palace and you share a good relationship with the great Chan Yu, Shula Kong, I'm certain you'll be able to provide a little assistance for us. After the Hus entered the pass, a lot of Hans were displaced from their homes, forced to wander about, and had their families ruined. The Jin court watches from across the river, but no one would dare forget the hatred of having our country invaded and our homes destroyed. Yuxian dare not let little brother take any risks, I just wanted to ask if it was possible. Brother Feng, when Chen Xin heard him, he turned around and faced Feng Qinyi, who was sitting on a wheelchair with his back facing Chen Xin, that won't do, I can't do that. The sound of the wheel being calibrated stopped. Feng Qinyi said, I'm not asking you to assassinate Fu Jian. Just that when it's convenient, to come up with a way to shield the Death Knights under my command in entering the palace. Wixian guarantees that I would never let you get involved. If this great undertaking is successful, you will be rewarded greatly. Chen Xing answered seriously, Brother Feng, what's the first ordinance for exorcists? I don't think you wouldn't know about it. I don't. Feng Qinyi put down his hand and said lightly, when I took over the position as head of the family, all I knew was that the Feng family once had an incredibly glorious past. If the power of the Sen Luo Saber was still around, how could the Hu's cavalry have had the chance to ravage the land within our pass? Chen Xin was a bit surprised. Upon hearing Feng Qinyi's tone, he did seem totally unaware. After all, it has been a really long time, so his tone eased as he answered, Before I went down the mountain, my Shifu exhorted over and over that as an exorcist, the first ordinance is that we must not intervene in civil court disputes. As the saying goes, the path of spirits belongs to spirits, the path of mortals belongs to mortals, right? Without waiting for Feng Qinyi's answer, Chen Xin continued his persuasion, while the second ordinance is. Feng Qinyi's tone turned unkind, what meaning do ordinances from 300 years ago even hold? Have you never questioned them? Chen Xin said, of course they're meaningful. The Feng families like me, all of us have a more important calling to fulfill, which is to protect the human world. If we're lucky and can really recover the lost magic, by that time, I may already be, already be, in any case, you'll know later. After Feng Qinyi stopped moving, he did not raise his hand again. When Chen Xin was about to turn back again, Feng Qinyi said, in that case, I no longer have a reason to help you, so please go back. Chen Xin. Even if your family, your relatives, Feng Qinyi turned his wheelchair around and faced Chen Xin, blocking the way to the last floor of the warehouse, all died under the hands of the Di people, you still wouldn't want to take revenge for them. Chen Xin, are you not going to let me in if I don't agree to your conditions? Feng Qinyi didn't answer and just looked up into Chen Xin's eyes. To tell you the truth, I have thought about it before. However, I don't have the spare time to take revenge, and I've understood that revenge is useless. Chen Xin began to realize that Feng Qinyi obviously didn't care much about the status of an exorcist. He was the one who had oversimplified the matter. His goal was to overthrow Fu Jian, and connecting this to Feng Qinyi's expression that made it seem like he wanted to say something, Chen Xin thought that Feng Qinyi must have mentioned this request before, but it was refused by Feng Qinyun. Fu Jian's death will only lead to someone else taking over as emperor and trigger a new type of civil unrest. Chen Xing said, it wasn't easy for fighting to stop in the north, and the resentment that the world can accommodate is approaching its limit. When he spoke up to this point, 
a thought suddenly surfaced in Chen Xing's mind the flickering flame in the lamp just now. Yet Feng Qinyi said in a cold voice, even if Yuan Xian was the one who personally executed your parents by hanging them, you've never thought of taking revenge for them. That sentence was like a clap of thunder that exploded next to Chen Xing's ears. W, what? Chen Xing took a step back and stared at Feng Qinyi in disbelief. Feng Qinyi, on the contrary, was a little surprised. He placed both elbows on the armrests of his wheelchair with his hands clasped and studied Chen Xing skeptically, you don't know? Right, Chen Zhe's only son disappeared on the day Jinyang city fell, where have you been all these years? Say that again. Chen Xing gasped, Yuan Xian killed my parents. See, Feng Qinyi said calmly, you're not totally indifferent to hatred, are you? It's just that the knife has not cut you yet, so you don't know what the pain feels like. Chen Tianke, as long as you promise. No way, Chen Xing said, why would he do that? Chen Xing's thoughts were in complete disarray now, and he had even forgotten his purpose in coming here for a moment. Yuan Xian's expression flooded his mind, and his whole body suddenly turned cold, as if he had just fallen into an ice cave. Under Feng Qinyi's gaze, a sudden chill filled the entire warehouse that spread in all directions. The flame within the lamp gradually weakened, and the shadows of the two that were cast on the wall seemed to be slowly melting away. However, right at this moment, the sound of footsteps approached, and a loud noise blared from the golden warehouse door. Chen Xing Feng Qinjun's voice rang out, and the flame in the lamp recovered in an instant, and the shadows returned to normal. Feng Qinyi and Chen Xin turned their heads at the same time and looked at the door. You shouldn't be here. Feng Qinyi's voice obviously carried a hint of anger. Chen Xin just stared at Feng Qinjun blankly. Feng Qinjun was holding a lamp as he said, there's a reason for this. Chen Xin, come up with me. If you continue staying here, I'm afraid that the entire bank would be torn down, let's go. Give an explanation first. Bright lights were lit throughout the Songbei residence. More than a thousand warriors looked like they were facing a powerful enemy and were either wielding crossbows or swords in their confrontation. There were servants inside as well, so the whole place was packed like sardines as the front of the gate was surrounded in a watertight encirclement. Xiang Shu was sitting on a stone with a plaque that had been folded into half thrown beside him. The Huan Chao knife that he seized from Feng Qinjun lay horizontally across his knees, while an incense stick was burning beside him. Great Chan Yu, Xifeng Bank's 60 year old main shopkeeper said politely, My Songbei residence and the ancient Qi Le Covenant has always minded their own business. With the enlightened Son of Heaven on the throne, Chang'an has Chang'an's laws. So why go this far? Relying on your martial prowess to commit such violence and smashing my shop's signboard, even if all of us were to be buried here today, what fear could we feel? You all would never be able to finish killing all the Hans in the world. Xiang Shu ignored him and casually glanced at the incense stick next to him. It was nearing its end, and the crowd of warriors actually took half a step back in retreat. The main shopkeeper has seen too many wars and massacres. His expression was grave, Xiang Shu barged into Xifeng Bank late at night, Feng Qinjun rushed over, and his family's precious knife was confiscated as soon as they met. After hearing rumors that this person had even barged into the imperial palace last night, if they offended him now, then everyone in the bank would likely die here, so they were all unflinchingly ready to meet their ends long ago. Fortunately, Feng Qinjun finally took Chen Xing out and they quickly walked out of the main entrance. What are you doing? Chen Xing finally snapped out of his trance. As soon as he saw the situation, he got angry, I just came to see brother Feng to do something. Xiang Shu didn't answer and casually flung the Sen Luo saber away, the saber spun round and round, looking like a silver plate as it shot towards Feng Qinjun with a whoosh. Feng Qinjun immediately reached out to grasp the handle of the saber, but the force it was thrown with was surprisingly strong and it pierced straight through a wooden pillar with a thud. 
Feng Qinjun tugged at it twice before finally yanking it out with much difficulty. Feng Qinjun and Xiang Shu were traveling companions for a short two months, and he knew that this man was rather temperamental, but he didn't expect Xiang Shu to not give him any face at all and to strike at them directly in order to find Chen Xing. Follow the great Chen Yu back to the palace first, Feng Qinjun said, we'll chat again another day when I pay you a visit. Guards. Prepare a carriage to send brother Chen back to the palace. After Xiang Shu found the person he wanted, he turned around to leave. Chen Xing quickly gave chase, he stood in front of Songbei residence's entrance and blew up, Xiang Shu. What do you mean by this? Xiang Shu had already left on his horse. The Feng family pulled up a carriage and came forward, so Chen Xing had to get on with a lot of discontent piled up in his heart. He kicked the soft chair within the carriage before sitting down angrily. End chapter.